Welcome to the second Tartarus devlog. In this video, I'll discuss two of the most important components in a 3D game world, and I'll show their implementation via Tartarus's Entity Component System architecture. Throughout, I'll use these components to demonstrate dynamic entities. In the first Tartarus devlog, I discussed the engine's two core graphics libraries, namely OpenGL and GLFW. I also demonstrated Tartarus's Entity Component System Architecture, which I'll just refer to as ECS for short. If you want a quick description of either library, or a more thorough description of ECS, take a look at that devlog. In this video, we'll charge full steam ahead and see an application of the ECS that's a tiny bit more exciting than a stationary orange triangle on a maroon background. Recall that with ECS, components define the entities that own them. Since most of the ways I'd like to apply the engine involve a 3D world, see Devlog Zero for more detail, I decided to start with two of the most important components that any 3D entity can possess, position and orientation. Let's begin with a position component, which will be vital for a wide range of entities, text, buttons, rigid bodies, creatures, and so on. Just as you'd expect, the position component represents an entity's position in three-dimensional space, although it's equally applicable in 2D and 1D. Because all our experiences and perceptions of the world are based in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z coordinates feel pretty familiar and intuitive. Let's take a glance at the source code to see how this is implemented. When discussing data-oriented design in Devlog Zero, I omitted one of the core design principles, which is to use plain old data structures to hold data whenever possible. This makes the data very flexible and accommodating to future modifications. So here, I've created a new position data type, represented by a structure, that defines the X, Y, and Z coordinates. I hope you'll agree that this is relatively simple. What's neat is that by defining position in 3D, we can trivially extend it to 2D and 1D scenarios by just not using the coordinates in the other one or two dimensions. Next, we need a system to operate on position components. Here, I've created a system called physics that primitively takes each position component and slightly increases the value of the X coordinate. It's nothing fancy, but just enough to get us started. Lastly, we'll assign a position component to an entity and instruct the physics system to update after each frame. Now, when I execute this program, we see the orange triangle march across the screen. That's a good sign and is hopefully more satisfying than Devlog 1's slightly mundane ending. But we're actually going to take this a step further. If I go back and change the physics system's operation to also operate on the Y coordinate sinusoidally, we can see that the triangle now dances across the screen in both X and Y. Nifty. Now, that's all great, but relatively speaking, making an entity move across the screen isn't that difficult. However, what's significantly more complicated is mathematically representing and changing an entity's orientation. What's interesting is that just like position, we're all intuitively familiar with 3D orientation, but we're generally not nearly as comfortable with how to express it. X, Y, and Z coordinates make a lot of sense, but what's the equivalent for orientations? There's a truckload of mathematics we could dive into that focus on how to represent 3D orientations, but in true Tartarus fashion, I'm gonna provide a simple, more intuitive description and punt the tedious lectures to the mathematicians. Generally, folks most commonly think of orientations and rotations using the classic Euler angle approach. An object is rotated about the X, Y, and Z axes by angles corresponding to each axis. Conveniently, these orientations can be represented well by a 3x3 matrix, and in one formulation of Euler angles, they're commonly referred to as roll, pitch, and yaw. Now, a brief tangent and some ribbing is in order. I'll be the first to say that I love and adore my family and friends from the southern part of the United States. However, I tend not to use what are considered traditionally southern phrases such as yee-haw very often. It just doesn't really fit naturally into my vocabulary and lexicon. And since yaw kinda sounds like a contraction of yee-haw, I'm not inclined to use it, especially if I'm discussing something mathematical. But in addition to intentionally avoiding this somewhat comical term, there's actually a much more significant weakness of using the matrical approach, and it pertains to interpolating rotation matrices. If we want to make an object gradually spin to a new orientation, then we need to compute a series of rotation matrices between its initial and final orientations. Unfortunately, when an object's orientation changes, even slightly, 
then the initial and final rotation matrices can be significantly different, making it very challenging to interpolate in these types of situations. Therefore, it's often very difficult to both quickly and smoothly reorient an entity using rotation matrices. It turns out that a significantly more flexible solution, quaternions, is commonly used to represent orientations. Even more so than rotation matrices, quaternions are a pretty involved mathematical concept that I won't attempt to cover here, but we can simply think of them as a 3D vector and an angle of rotation about that vector. Just like rotation matrices, this combination of vector and angle can be used to describe any orientation in three dimensions or less. Note, however, that quaternions use only four components to describe an orientation, whereas the matrix uses nine. Also, unlike rotation matrices, quaternions offer smooth transitions between different orientations, and they also simplify the process for reducing floating point rounding errors and rotation calculations. These advantages make life simpler, but note that OpenGL still expects rotation matrices before it'll properly orient and draw our entities. Fortunately, quaternions are actually quite easily converted into the rotation matrices we desire. Taking a look at the source code, just like with position, I've created a new quaternion data type that defines the W, X, Y, and Z components of the quaternion. Note that the X, Y, and Z components represent the vector I described, and the W component represents the amount of rotation about that vector. Next, we need a system to operate on quaternions, but before getting into that, I'm gonna make a simplifying change that'll pay dividends in the future. Nearly all the entities I make in a game world will require a position and orientation. Tartarus's data-oriented design paradigm would suggest that when components are very frequently used together, it might make sense to treat them as one piece of data. Therefore, I'll make a new component called transform that includes a position and quaternion component. Now we can create entities with positions and orientations without having to separately handle either. In applications where position and orientation are frequently used together, we might even see a performance improvement since these components will often be loaded into computer memory simultaneously. Also in the future, if there are any additional components that are closely related to position and orientation, maybe something like size or scale, we can add it to this group and it'll automatically cascade to every entity with a transform. Now, I just need to update the physics system to operate on transforms. With the adjustments, the system will still change the X and Y positions, but also incrementally change the rotation about the Z axis. Lastly, we'll need to assign this new transform component to an entity and update the main loop. When I execute this updated code, we see the orange triangle now rotates while it moves across the screen. If I go back and change the physics system's orientations to rotate about the Y and Z axes, it looks a little odd because I haven't yet implemented a 3D perspective, but the triangle now exhibits even more complicated behavior. Obviously, many of you watching this video probably think this is kind of neat, but I'm thrilled with this result. What excites me is thinking of all the potential components we could add in the future. For example, what if we wanted the orange triangle to exhibit something akin to Brownian motion? we could easily create a random walk component that specifies how jittery the entity's path should be. Or suppose we wanted to focus on building out more sophisticated and elaborate physics. We could add a velocity, acceleration, and mass component, and then correct our physics system such that only entities experiencing a net force end up moving. We could then augment our physics system with gravity, conservation of energy, and so forth. Perhaps we'd want to experiment with some fictitious form of mass whose gravitational properties vary as a function of time. We could add a weird mass component that specifies the strength of its gravitational interaction and the frequency of variation, and so on. For me, those are some pretty exciting ideas to ponder, but there's still a lot of core engine functionality to build out before we can start experimenting with these types of components. Nonetheless, if we're strictly discussing their core functionalities and implementations, that is, not including things like import statements, helper functions for initialization, and so on, I've managed to add a position and quaternion component, combine them into a transform component, and implement a physics system for operating on these components in roughly 50 to 75 lines of code. Certainly, the physics system will become more complex in future iterations, but the point remains. Any component or system I want to add just needs to adhere to the loose requirements defined by Tartarus's ECS, and it's ready to go. Just like I said at the end of devlog one, there are a lot of possibilities we'll get to explore in future devlogs. And this, it's just the tip of the iceberg on what's to come. 
thanks for watching. I'm off to a good start and things are picking up speed. If you enjoyed this content, I'd appreciate a like and your subscription if you want to stay up to date on this devlog series. Your ideas and suggestions are welcome, so leave me a comment on what features or content you'd like to see in a future devlog video. Until next time, remember to intentionally seek out and understand the perspectives and reasonings of those with whom you disagree.